suppressing viruses, tracking online criminals, and most importantly, trying to understand where the attacks are coming from. And based on that, based on almost 24 years of working inside this field, I can tell you that right now the world is changing faster than ever before. And we are actually seeing more new attacks and more new malware than ever before in history. And we have one thing to blame that for, and that is the Internet. Because it is the Internet which is changing everything. So let me give you an example on how the Internet is changing everything. I'm Finnish. I live in Helsinki. The main export for Finland as a country for centuries was paper and forestry products. So wood, pulp, and paper. That's what we used to make, and that's what we used to export. In the early days, it was things like tar that, you would, that we would be exporting from Finland. So things we made out of wood, because we have lots of forests. But then, for a small window, for 20 years, our main export was not paper or wood. It was mobile phones. That was the time of Nokia. Now, every morning when I leave my home and drive to our offices in downtown Helsinki, I'm actually driving by this building, which is the Nokia headquarters. So on May 12th, when I was driving to work, I drove by this building, and I noticed that the logo on the building had changed to Microsoft. From Nokia, to Microsoft. And let me tell you, it felt really bad. <laughs> but after all, Nokia survived. They sold the mobile phone business to Microsoft. Nokia still exists. It's a smaller company, but it exists. That also meant that our main export was no longer mobile phones, because there is no longer Nokia mobile phones operating from Finland. Now, quite Clearly, the reason why this change happened was the Internet. Nokia was the number one maker of traditional handsets, and they never really made the leap to smartphones, the phones that you actually use the Internet with. That was done by players like Apple and Google. And on the very same day, on the 12th of May, when this logo changed on the, on the wall of this building, on that very same day, a company called Metsa Group in Finland announced that they will start building a new pulp factory, a billion dollar pulp factory in central Finland, which, is, which was sort of unexpected. Like, why would you build a new factory making pulp? Because we know that the need for paper has been plummeting. I mean, you know this. You don't read most of your news anymore from newspapers. You read it online, right? So the need for paper is going down. We read more and more of our books with Kindles and iPads instead of traditional paper books. However, even though the internet once again is taking away the need for paper, at the very same time it's increasing something else. And that's has all to do with this new pulp factory, because that pulp factory will not be making pulp for paper. It will be making pulp for cardboard, like cardboard boxes. And that's important, because today when you shop, you shop online, and your goods will be shipped to you via mail in a cardboard box. So while the need for paper is going down, the need for cardboard is skyrocketing. So once again, it's the internet. The internet is changing everything. And in our area, in computer security, obviously, all the attacks we see today are moving over the internet. They are being distributed through websites, through email attachments, through the hidden web. And the actual command and control of all the botnets, obviously, is done over the internet. And we are seeing big shifts. The enemy is changing. 
When I started analyzing malware, defining the enemy was very simple. In 1991, when I decoded my first malware, the enemy was teenage boys. All the viruses were written by kids, and their motive was writing malware for fun. They got nothing out of it. They made no money, they did get no fame, they got nothing out of it. It was just a challenge. Around 12, 13 years ago, we started seeing first criminal attackers, the ones who were making malware and launching online attacks to make money. Guys like this guy right here. And money is a good motivator. Money is why most of us go to work, actually. Money is what drives online crime. If you can become a millionaire by writing malware, it's not really a surprise that somebody's going to do it. Then around a decade ago, we faced, in addition of online criminals, a new challenge from the, in the form of hacktivists, movements like Anonymous, which started becoming more and more prominent around eight, nine, ten years ago. Roughly at the same time, we also started facing, frankly, a quite surprising development, which was the fact that we see more and more online attacks and malware being written by governments. Whether it's law enforcement using malware to infect their own citizens to inspect them for crimes, or whether it's foreign nation states to do global surveillance against everybody who's using the internet, or whether it's targeted attacks launched by intelligence agencies to spy on foreign governments and on foreign companies. All of those are examples of governmental malware writing. In addition of that, we also see more and more militaries involved in writing malware. And frankly, this would have been science fiction 10 years ago. If somebody would have come to me in 2004 and tell me that by 2014 it will be commonplace for developed Western democratic countries to write viruses and to actively use them to infect other Western democratic friendly nations, that would have sounded like science fiction. But that's exactly what we're seeing. So online criminals, out of these different players, are probably the easiest ones to understand. And that means that we have now the split in three. The criminals, the hacktivists, and the government. But we might be facing the fourth group emerging right now. And that would be cyber terrorism. And when I say cyber terrorism, I mean real world terror groups who would be doing their attacks online. And this is something I studied quite a bit three years ago. Three years ago, I made a talk at the RSA conference on this very topic. And three years ago, my outcome of this research was that terror groups do operate online, but they don't have the capability to do attacks online. That was three years ago. It's important to understand that any single terror group you'll find will use the internet for communication, <clears throat> will use the internet for recruitment, will use the internet for propaganda. But that's not really very interesting. That's, that's using the internet like any other organization is using it, like, you know, like your company is using it for communication, for recruitment, and so on. So, of course, the, the terror groups do that as well. The question was, are they capable of doing actual attacks? Now, three years ago, I wasn't worried about that. Right now, I think we probably should start worrying it. And the reason is ISIS. They have new capabilities that we haven't seen from previous terror groups. We have several examples. For example, um, a hacker we were tracking three years ago, a guy called Junaid Hussain. His online name was Trick. Belonged to a British hacker group called uh, Team Poison. He was the leader of the hacker group. This group was loosely connected to Anonymous. They did lots of defacements, did a lot of service attacks. They ran botnets. Their biggest claim to fame was hacking the voicemail of Tony Blair and then leaking his voicemail messages. Trick, Mr. Hussein, actually got caught over that hack, got charged and got sentenced 
He was 12, 20 years old when he got sentenced for 18 months in prison. However, he fled the sentence. He disappeared and he went off the radar. He never went to jail. So we had no idea where Mr. Hussein is until we found him this summer. And we found him from Syria. He's right now in Syria. He's joined the ISIS and he's fighting as part of this terror group. And here's a guy who does know how to hack into services. If you look around, you'll easily find ISIS pages where they educate each other on how to use tools like Metasploit. And you'll also find them running websites in the hidden service, in Tor hidden service, where they take donations for ISIS in Bitcoin. So these guys know how to use the internet. So it might very well be that soon we don't just have to worry about guys like him, but we might have to worry about terrorists as well. So online criminals rarely get caught. So we rarely get to see what they actually look like. These are the rare exceptions that I could dig up easily from cases that we were working with over the last year or two. This guy is from St. Petersburg. Now, the ways these guys make their money keeps changing as well. Money-making mechanisms used to be fairly simple. You write a banking Trojan, you infect somebody's computer, then you wait for him to do online transfers in his online bank, and your Trojan will change the account numbers on the fly and steal the money. Or you write a keylogger, infect somebody's computer, and then wait for them to do online shopping, which means they will type in their name, their delivery address, their credit card number, their expiration date, and their security code. But what's interesting in these attacks, and what's changing right now, is the target of the attack. The target of attacks like ransom trojans or banking trojans or keyloggers is the user. They target the human being behind the keyboard. So for example, if this computer gets infected by, by a keylogger, it's going to make no money for the attacker unless I'm behind the keyboard typing in something valuable like credit card numbers or passwords to PayPal. If I'm not there, the Trojan will never make any money. Now keep that in mind. We'll get back to that. Traditional attacks target not the computer, but the user of the computer. A very good example of that is ransom Trojans. Trojans which have been one of the biggest headache we've had for the last year and, and a half. <clears throat> Trojans like CryptoLocker or CryptoWall or CryptoDefense or Reveton which always work with the same principle. They will infect your system, typically through the web, typically to an exploit kit, which means you get infected as you browse the web. And then they will lock your system, and then they will demand a payment from you in order to continue working. They might just lock the system, or they might actually encrypt your files. This is CryptoLocker. It uses uh, RSA 2048 to encrypt your files. Then it asks you to pay a ransom to get your files back. And the important thing about CryptoLocker is that if you actually pay, they will send you a program which will decrypt your files. So at least they are honest criminals. And they have to be honest criminals because they have a reputation to maintain. If reputation is important for ransom Trojan gangs. Why? Well, the first thing you would do if you get hit by a ransom Trojan like this is that you will Google, well, not on this computer, but on another computer, you will Google whether it works. Like, if I pay, will I get my files back? And if you actually do that, you'll find people online who will tell you that, yeah, I got hit by it, I paid, and I got my files back. And then maybe you will pay as well. So they need a reputation to uphold. They also need a reputation because these guys are not alone. They are actually competing with other gangs. There's competition amongst the criminals. When someone comes up with a bright idea, which actually works, right, like ransom Trojans, they very quickly get competition. So CryptoLocker is operating from Moscow area. They, the biggest competition they get is from Crypto Defense, which looks like this, which is coming from St. Petersburg. 
And crypto locker and crypto defense and crypto wall, they don't just encrypt the files on your hard drive. They mount, they mount every single mount they can find from your system. They mount the drives and they will encrypt the files there as well. That includes network drives. So if you are a corporate user, it will mount all your network drives and it will encrypt every file you can write to. And now we can all take a moment and think about how much write access we would have in our organizations. Like if our laptop gets infected and it's going to encrypt overnight the whole network, how much would it actually overwrite? And it's not just the network drives either. If you have cloud storage solutions, which you can mount as a drive, it's going to mount those as well. And that's shitty, because many of us take backups in the cloud. So it's going to encrypt your backups. And that's one of the reasons why many resort to paying. Because in theory, you would never have to pay a ransom for a Trojan like this. All you have to do is restore your backups from yesterday and carry on. Surprisingly many people and surprisingly many organizations can do that. I know because we've worked with surprisingly many organizations which resorted to paying these clowns. And I hate when these clowns get money from organizations and from, from victims. But some organizations have been forced to pay. My favorite example is this police station in the United States which got infected with CryptoLocker. And they had no backups, and they had to pay. So the cops paid the criminals to get their files back. You might also pay attention in the detail in this screen that the payment mechanism they use is Bitcoin. We'll get back to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is interesting and it's relevant. But there's another thing about ransom trojans that I also want to mention, and that's that they are not just targeting Windows computers. We've seen the first ones which actually target um, OS X, Mac computers. And uh, we've also seen the first ones which target um, um, Android phones and some uh, smart televisions. Yes, I have it. Here's a screenshot of a Android phone locked by uh, uh, crypto wall, uh, sorry, this is uh, Browlock. That it's a, it's a uh, very simple ransom trojan, but it does work on an Android. And here's a LG smart TV locked by the Reveton trojan. The screenshot, I mean, the, it claims to be the cops. It, this is in Finnish because we took the photo in Finland. It, it does GOIP, so here in Poland it would actually be in, in Polish. And let me tell you one thing about Poland. It's really confusing every single time when I'm here in Poland, because I'm walking down the street and I see URLs, like website addresses, like, you know, nask.pl. And I keep thinking about Perl. Like, you know, there's lots of Perl scripts everywhere, like <laughs> nask.pl, cert.pl, you know, google.pl. <laughs> and then another related thing that we've been seeing a lot over the last year are attacks against payment terminals, point of sales terminals. And when you think about point of sales, many of us think about these handheld devices, which you see a lot in Europe. But the Trojans that have been problematic over the last year in the United States with companies like Home Depot and Target, they're not targeting the handheld ones. They're targeting point of sales terminals, which look like this, which are running Windows, typically Windows embedded, which basically is just a code word for Windows XP. That's what they infect. And the way they steal the credit card numbers is that they scrape them from the memory. So as they still use Mac Stripe cards in the United States instead of chip and pin, as they swipe the card, they actually store the card data in plain text in memory and the Trojans scrape them from the memory. And then when we look at where these massive collections of credit cards which are being sold online are coming from, they're either coming from these point of sale terminal Trojans or they're coming from keyloggers, which collect them from the victim's computers as they type them in themselves. They get a little bit different data from, um, from these. For example, the track one and track two data that they get from the credit card uh, swiping doesn't contain all the same information as you would get from a user who actually types in his details as he's doing online shopping. But speaking about online shopping, let's talk about this guy. His name is Satoshi Nakamoto. Five years ago, he wrote a scientific paper 
in which he described this complicated thing that he called a blockchain. And his paper described a peer-to-peer -peer network which would maintain this blockchain. And with that, you could create a currency, a currency based on math, a currency based on crypto. And his paper was titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. This is where Bitcoin started from. And you've all, all heard about Bitcoin. The things you've heard about Bitcoin include that, you know, it's something that the bad people use and the criminals use, and that's what you use to buy drugs online. Well, yeah, of course, that's, you could do that. But you could say exactly the same criticism about cash. Criminals prefer cash. Most of drug trade is being done with cash. But cash in itself isn't bad. We all use cash ourselves. Bitcoin in itself isn't bad. It's just means of moving wealth. What makes it different from any other currency is that it's not, the value of the currency is not based on any other currency. The Bitcoin value is not based on the value of dollars or euros or gold or anything. Its value is based on how useful the users think it is as a means of moving wealth. And cryptocurrencies and digital currencies have been a challenge for 20 years. We've been trying to make this work for 20 years and we've been failing for 20 years. All the digital currencies that I've seen have failed because of the two main problems they have. Problem number one, how do you confirm the transactions? Problem number two, how do you inject new currency into the system without causing inflation? So let me take an example on how Bitcoin actually works. Um, so let's say you buy me a beer later today. You, can you buy me a beer? All right, thank you. Um, I want to pay you back though, but I have no slotties on me right now. I only have, I have euros or I, let's say I have no money on me at all. So I'm going to pay you back when I get back home to Helsinki. All right. And I'm not going to pay you in slotties or euros. I'm going to pay you in Bitcoin. So for that, all I need is your Bitcoin address, your Bitcoin wallet address. Now, this is very similar to email. If I want to get back in touch with you when I get back home to Finland, I'm going to need your address, your email address. Right? So when I get back home, I'm going to take my email program, type in your email address and send you an email. Well, with Bitcoin, when I get back home, I'll take your Bitcoin wallet address. I'll type it into my Bitcoin program, which could be on my computer or my phone. And then I'm going to send you money. So it's very similar to sending email. And it's also similar in the sense that it's going to be a direct transaction between me and you. And that gives us then a problem, like how will this transaction between you and me, how is that going to be confirmed? Because there are no banks to confirm transactions in the Bitcoin world. And the answer is this transaction will be confirmed by the rest of you. Other users in the Bitcoin network will confirm our transaction by doing complicated mathematical calculations which will lock this transaction into place. Which gives us the next question. Why would you do it? Why would other users of the network confirm our transaction? I mean, you don't know us. Why would you spend your valuable computing time to confirm this? And the answer is you will do it because the algorithm will reward you. When you confirm other people's transactions, the algorithm will give you free bitcoins. That's why you do it. And this is how the algorithm injects new currency into the system. And this is the great invention of Satoshi Nakamoto. He solved the two toughest problems in digital currencies by joining the problem. Remarkable. Very, very clever. And you've actually heard about this before. You've heard about Bitcoin mining. You've heard about people mining for Bitcoins. And you've heard about them running powerful computers and doing complicated calculations to mine and somehow create new money. Well, that's exactly what they're doing. They're confirming transactions. So mining for bitcoins isn't just doing calculations for no reason. They're actually confirming transactions of other users. So the more we, people we have mining, the more 
secure and faster the transactions are. So when Bitcoin was very young, let's say four years ago, it was almost worthless. One Bitcoin was worth less than one euro cent. So if you wanted to mine for Bitcoins, you had to mine a lot and you would have to be using really cheap hardware to do it if you wanted the hardware to pay itself back. So this is a photo from four years ago of one hobby is to build the absolute cheapest computer you could build. An old CRT, an old motherboard, no case, then leave it online for six months and it confirms lots of transactions and it makes lots of bitcoins which were almost worthless. But it made enough bitcoins that it's actually eventually going to make you know, 50 euros. So it pays itself back. But then the value of Bitcoin started growing. First from one cent to one euro, then to 10 euros, then to 100 euros, then to 1,000 euros. And then people got interested in, oh, hold on, who actually invented this? Who is this Satoshi guy? So they went looking for Satoshi Nakamoto, only to realize that Satoshi Nakamoto doesn't exist. There is no Satoshi Nakamoto. There never was. Satoshi Nakamoto. We don't know who invented Bitcoin, which is interesting. Some people and some newspapers have claimed they found the guy. They didn't. We still today don't know who's behind it. I don't think it's a guy at all. I think it's some kind of an organization, but I don't know which one. Now, banks are quite worried about Bitcoin. Actually, that's incorrect. Banks don't really even understand what Bitcoin is. If they would understand what it is, they would be worried about it. Bitcoin and its um, children, let's say other coins based on the same idea, they will not kill banks. They will only kill the money moving business of banks. We will still be needing banks for savings and for, for loans, maybe, investments but we will not be needing banks in the long run for moving money. That's going to move to digital currencies, not to Bitcoin. It still has some problems in it, but some of the future currencies based on the same ideas will kill money moving business, take it away from banks. And we will not be able to regulate cryptocurrencies. Governments will not be able to regulate it. Most governments don't even want to regulate it. Governments don't care how you move your wealth as long as you pay your taxes. They don't care if you use lotties or euros or rubles as long as you pay your taxes. And if governments try to regulate Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, they will fail. Because how do you regulate a Bitcoin algorithm? It's an algorithm. How do you regulate an algorithm? An, an algorithm will not listen to you. It's math. It will not listen to your regulation. You can try to regulate it, but you will fail. Now, how is this relevant to us? Well, remember what I said a couple of minutes ago about attacks, which used to target the user, the human being. Well, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are introducing a new threat scenario where the attack is not targeting the user, it's targeting the actual computer. Because if bitcoins are created by mining, which is confirming other people's transactions, that means that now we have a mechanism of converting CPU power into money. Because if you have powerful computers, purpose-built to do nothing else than mine for bitcoins. What they actually are doing is that they're taking CPU power and converting it into money. And some people are doing this very seriously. Here's a photo of the largest bitcoin mining data center operating in the United States. In fact, this guy is running two full data centers full of ASIC based purpose built bitcoin mining rigs. And he's making millions with it. So let's think this through. Converting computing power into cash. Very quickly, you realize that if you can actually do that, the computing power you're converting into cash doesn't have to be your own computing power. It can be somebody else's computing power. The first examples of this 
we saw with some universities which are running powerful data centers and running powerful supercomputers. We started finding university students borrowing some supercomputer time for their own need to mine for bitcoins, which of course is not really a nice thing to do. Then we started finding botnets, which were monetizing themselves, not by dropping keyloggers, but by dropping mining tools, which would mine for Bitcoin or Litecoin or Namecoin or Zerocoin or Dogecoin or any of these currencies. Most of them are actually not mining for Bitcoins because Bitcoins are very hard to mine nowadays. So they go for altcoins, which are easier to mine. And that's the crucial step, because now when this computer gets infected with a mining Trojan, now suddenly I'm irrelevant. Now suddenly it doesn't matter if I'm at the keyboard. They're going to make exactly the same amount of money, whether I'm at the keyboard working or whether I'm away from the keyboard. They're not targeting the user, they're targeting the CPU. And that means that they suddenly have a whole lot of new kind of computers they can target. You've heard about the Internet of Things, huh? Have you, haven't you? The Internet of Things. Computers coming everywhere. Computers coming into our cars, computers coming into our watches. I have a pebble right here, so my wristwatch has a CPU and an IP address. Now, whoever would be interested in infecting these things? If, if somebody's going to infect these things, they're going to have to have a reason for doing it. And that reason typically would be money. So how do you make money by infecting wristwatches? Well, if they have CPUs, they have computing power. And one watch isn't going to mine a lot of cryptocurrencies, but a million watches will. So suddenly we actually have a logical reason for criminals to target the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is not in the future. The Internet of Things is here today. And I can prove that to you. A friend of mine, Dan Tetler, was speaking in August in DEF CON in Vegas. He was speaking about VNC. And you all know VNC, Remote Desktop Connections. He wrote a script which was scanning for IP addresses. And whenever it would connect to an IP address, it would try connecting with the VNC client. And if there was a VNC server, he would try connecting to it. If the server asked for a password, he would disconnect and try the next IP. But if it didn't ask for a password, he would connect, take a screenshot, and then disconnect. He scanned the whole internet the whole IPv4 address space, four to two billion IPs. And he found more than 20,000 VNC servers, which required no password. And then he started posting pictures of the services he found online. He started posting them to Twitter. Let me show you, show you some examples. Here's one system he connected to. It's Phil's Office Lights. It's an online system where you can control the lights of an office. Turn lights off, turn lights on, change the temperature, turn off the alarm system. And this was online. This had a remote desktop system installed on it, and it required no password. Then he found an oil field. Then he found a wheat silo. Then he found a dam. A dam online connected to the internet with a remote desktop with no password. Then he found a SCADA system, a factory system, this is actually a food processing plant in Sweden, online with remote desktop with no password. Then he found a radio station, and you could actually watch the DJ select the next songs and the next ads, which of course means that whoever is connected to it could also select the next songs and the next ads. But that would actually be illegal, because then you would be doing unauthorized access, I guess. But just connecting to a system which requires no password can't possibly be illegal, right? It's online, it asks no password. And then he found a train control system. And then he found curtains. Dan found curtains online. Curtains that you could open or close online. 
And when we've reached the state when the curtains on, are online, then, my friends, I've proven to you that the Internet of Things is not in the future. The Internet of Things is here today. When curtains are online, the Internet of Things is here today. Right? Let me give you one last example, because then Dan also found a bed, a hospital bed, with a live patient on the bed. So you could actually see his heart rate, his blood sugar levels, and uh, his blood pressure. And I actually asked a friend of mine who knows about medical things, these values are OK. He's probably going to make it. <laughs> so now we have a logical reason for all of these devices to be attacked. The risks against the Internet of Things is not that somebody is going to hack your car and drive you off a cliff. I mean, that's not credible. That, I'm not worried about that at all. But when you can make money by targeting the Internet of Things with the combination of the Internet of Things and cryptocurrency mining, yeah, that is a credible threat. Now, later today, there will be talk about Heartbleed from my colleagues from CERT Finland. Probably also about shell shock. And these are both examples of major global security vulnerabilities which are coming from the side of open source, free and open source code. And that's a varying trend. Because for example, Heartbleed vulnerability was found inside the open SSL library, which is very, very common. And that was basically before Heartbleed was found. It was a hobbyist project run by five guys with a budget of $2,000. And when you're running critical infrastructure built on top of hobbyist projects, it starts to worry me. But you'll hear more about that later today. Let me wrap up my talk talking a little bit about governmental attacks. And like I mentioned in the beginning, we have different kinds of governmental attacks. We have law enforcement using malware. We have intelligence agencies using malware. We have militaries using malware. Let me take a recent example of surveillance done by governments. So this is from Hong Kong. We all know what's happening in Hong Kong with these demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations for change, organized by multiple different units, one of them known as Code for HK. And Code for HK is organizing these protests with mobile applications. So here is a WhatsApp message which was distributed to the demonstrators with a link through which you could download an app to your Android phone, which you could use to get information about where the next demonstration will be. The problem was that this message was not sent by the organizers. This message was sent from mainland China. We believe this was an attack launched by Chinese government against the demonstrators, because the application you would download would actually be a backdoor, and it would report back your location and your contacts list from your phone. So we're speaking about this kind of governmental attacks. Malware written and deployed by governments in order to watch over what people are doing. And we've learned quite a bit about governments launching attacks to do surveillance over the last year and a half, thanks to Edward Snowden. Blaming United States government for their rude attacks against the rest of the world is it's almost too easy. And when we do that, we tend to forget that it's not the United States alone. Yes, they've been doing lots of shitty things over the last years, and they've turned the internet into a surveillance state. But most of the things they've done, they've been able to do because they have unique visibility, because we all keep using American services. And when we foreigners use American services, we have no rights. But if history would have turned out different, if it would have been another country in the same position, they probably would misuse these powers even worse. Let's say if China or Russia would have been the country which would have ended up having all these services that we would use, things would probably be even worse. And of course, China and Russia are doing online attacks right now. They just can't do as wide attacks because they don't have the visibility that the United States has. But let me give you an example of what Russia is doing. Cosmic Duke is a piece of malware we've been analyzing for quite a while. It's based on an older malware called, uh, 
Um, well, actually, several different malware families. But what's interesting about Cosmic Duke is that we started picking up lots of activity around a year ago in Ukraine. And that's interesting because of what's been happening in Ukraine. We know Cosmic Duke is coming from Russia. We believe it's linked to Russian government. And over the last 12 months, the two most active hotspots in the world where we have been finding um, Cosmic Duke are in Ukraine and in Poland. Let me actually show you a map. This is done by our colleagues at ESET, who've also been looking at Cosmic Duke for quite a while. We've shared a lot of interest. This is their map of where they've been seeing targeted attacks launched by Cosmic Duke. Ukraine and Poland, the Pearl country. The way Cosmic Duke works is that it's, it's an APT. It hits your system, then it can steal any files remotely, encrypt them, and send them away. And the way it's actually distributed is very typical to APTs, which is targeted email attachments. And natively, Cosmic Duke is a 32-bit Windows malware. When it's actually compiled by the attackers, it's natively a screensaver. So basically, that's what it looks like. That's what it looks like when it's created by the attackers originally. File.scr, a screensaver, 900 kilos in size. Now, if you receive that in email as an attachment, you're probably not going to click on that. Even if it comes from someone you know, and, and the emails it has been distributed in have been spoofed to look like they come from someone you know and trust. However, when the attackers have been distributing Cosmic Duke, it doesn't look like this. They've changed it. First thing they did is that they changed the icon of the screensaver from the default icon to the icon of a PDF file. Don't ask me why Windows allows you to change the screensaver icon to an icon of a PDF file, but it does. Then the next thing they did is that they renamed the file name from file.scr to this. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, but that's because this file name is still missing one character, the first character in the file name, which is the Unicode right to left override character. And that's the character you use for languages which are written from right to left, like Arabic. It's an invisible character, but it will cause Windows to display the next characters in reverse order. So when we add that invisible character, the file name becomes RCS.Ukraine Gas Pipeline Security Report March 2014.pdf. This is not a PDF file. It's a screensaver file. And you can tell it's a screensaver file because the file name starts with RCS, which is SCR reversed. But would you click on this? If you will receive an email from your boss, and this is as the attachment, would you click on this? Well, many people would. So this is where we've arrived. From the early attackers, to criminals, to hacktivists, to terrorists, to governments. My friends, we are in the middle of an arms race. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we only have time for one question. May I invite you to ask him questions? America has an advantage because we are all users of their services. Uh, I'm not expecting you to share any particular details of your setup, but what would you recommend as replacements for Facebook, Google, Dropbox, etc.? When, we, <clears throat> when we've tried to fight wholesale blanket surveillance done by the United States, there are technical things that we can do. Right, so we can use more encryption. We know encryption works. Strong, strong encryption works. So encrypt your email, encrypt your hard drive, use VPNs, run Tor, things like that. However, those are sort of like band-aids. Like they're going to help with the immediate pain, but they do nothing to fix the underlying problem, which is wholesale blanket surveillance. And there's two ways we can fight that. One is political. Like let's have, let's stand up and say no. Let's have our politicians stand up and say no. And the other choice is, well, stop using 
those American services, because we are foreigners, we have no rights when we use American mm. services, and when US intelligence agencies are collecting our information, they are breaking no laws. It's perfectly legal for them to collect our data as we use American services and to keep our data forever. And that's really easy to say, and that's really hard to do. And that's our own fault. It's our own fault here in Europe that we have no alternatives. Like if I tell you to stop using Google, mm -hmm. then what are you going to use? Like where are the European search engines? Where are the European mm -hmm. social media services? Where are the European cloud storage services? Where are the European alternatives? How come we are unable to compete? Europe is bigger than the United States. We have more people. Our budget is bigger than the United States. We have bigger universities. We have universities which have been around for a thousand years, and we are unable to compete. And that's something we, ha we have ourselves to blame for. And when we have smart young people, for example, smart young people here in Poland, when they want to start new tech startups and, and somehow change this, typically the very first thing they do is that first they move to Silicon Valley and then they start their startup. And that's our problem. And we have ourselves to blame for that. Thank you very much for your presentation and for the answer.